And welcome back. It's been quite the break from doing these, but I'm glad we're back. Over the last two years, it's been my favorite part of the week, getting to speak candidly with some of the people I find most interesting in the growth space. And today's guest is no exception. Hey, Rich, thanks for joining us and welcome to this week's sixth session. Today's session is going to be about sales, double. not yep. the always, yeah, double rich. Yeah. <laughs> Not the always be closing, sell me this pen, dirty stereotype kind of sales, but the talent rich, nurturing performance side of sales, qualification, training, insight and education. Those are the topics I'm going to be quizzing today's guest on. And today's guest is someone I've admired in the growth space for a couple of years now. He's an author, coach, and more importantly, in my opinion, a practitioner of sales. We're going to talk SaaS growth, finding and nurturing talent, the change face of sales and how tech can, but sometimes doesn't, feed into overall sales performance. And also what it's like to go from co-founder to employee. Over the past the last two years, the six sessions have given me the opportunity to chat with some amazing people in the growth space. And today's guest is the proud owner of one of those insightful brains where I'll definitely walk away feeling smarter by association. He's a VP of sales in Amir for a Lego and uh, an investor and all round sales content creator. And if, you, if you're interested in how you, your team or your organization sell better, this is going to be insightful 30 minutes. These chats are designed to be short and sweet and hopefully full of insight. And it's definitely unfiltered, which as a reminder is the fun bit for me. I also want to point out that this is the first for the year and sets the tone for the next 12 months. So no pressure, Rich, and don't balls it up. Joining us from Newcastle, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Richard Smith. Rich, welcome. No, thanks for having me on. Uh, probably the, the, the biggest and best introduction I've ever had in my life. So, um, Do you know what? Really I, pride, I pride myself on these, actually. I spend quite a lot of time and quite often I giggle my way through writing them and then have to go back and re-edit some of them. <laughs> so, uh, Fair enough. There was, when, I, when I wrote this, we were slightly closer to Man United uh, beating uh, you oh, in uh, Newcastle in the Cup. So I did have a little joke about that, but I was like, actually, it's a couple of weeks gone now. So it's not really going to make sense anymore. But yeah. <laughs> so how are things? How was 2022 for you? Yeah, 2022 was, uh, um, I, I guess, a good good year overall. It was an interesting year because I think we saw this um, <clears throat> just weird, almost out of the blue, uh, you know, recessionary conditions that just came out of nowhere, which which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get into a, a, a little bit. But, um, you know, yeah, it was a year for me in a professional sense where, um, you know, my became part of this bigger company a lego and um lots of lots of change and lots of new things to learn and um new markets that i'm selling into and um yeah so so it was was a was an eventful yeah put it that way um uh and uh but yeah lots of lots of good learnings from it too Nice. And and what's your main business? What does Allego do? Now, obviously, I'm asking this for the wider audience. I am an avid Allego customer. Um, it's part of our, our sales tech stack. <clears throat> I know the guy that sold it to me. Um, so what is it that Allego does? Yeah, so Allego uh, is uh, basically a sales enablement platform. So we, we're in the, the um, sales enablement space. Um, really, Allego exists to help companies do everything from onboard and train ramp their new sales hires um, we uh, help companies roll out new messaging new products to their sales teams help their sales teams manage and share content with customers but we also have um i guess the what used to be the refract piece of the uh, of the jigsaw so to speak is now part of the lego platform which is the whole piece around conversation intelligence which is, is really about helping companies get insights into What's going on on the front line when their revenue teams engage with with customers and prospects? So, I guess we put all those pizza slices together, and we have you know a, a, a platform that we we sell into you know growth organisations, those companies who are looking to really move the needle in their sales force. And and what's your role at Lego now? Yeah, so my my role is um, I the essentially head up the uh, sales function of our EMEA team. Um, Allego was a you know headquartered North American business and built a really successful, great footprint in in North America, and it's now all about expanding to other sides, uh, parts of the world. So yeah, I'm responsible for a, a growing team here, um, selling into the the EMEA territory. How how big is your team now? Like in in EMEA? Yeah, so in EMEA, the 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 business in total, and this this includes um, sales, customer success, marketing, um, product. Uh, we're about say 50, 50 heads, um, and the sales, the sales arm of that, um, is about 
um, just shy of 15 people at the minute. So, and uh, how did how did you personally get into sales? I'm always interested in uh, like understanding people's like journey into growth because yeah. I, I would say nine out of ten do it accidentally. Yeah, I, I definitely say I probably yeah you could definitely say it was accidental for myself. It was never one of those careers that I grew up um, you know telling my tell my mom that I was uh, aspired to be a, a, a salesperson. Um, and even going to university, I, you know, I always tell the story that I <clears throat> I was quite interested in IT when I was when I was younger. Um, it was always a a subject that I excelled at, you know, spent a lot of my youth playing video games and, and such like. And I, I ended up doing like a computer science degree at university. And, you know, what, what university taught me was that I, I absolutely did not want to be a developer. Uh, <laughs> certainly didn't have the brains to be a developer. And uh, Important lesson. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think at the end of it was just, you know, like, like many, many students going and doing a, getting a degree and at the end of it thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Um, and sales was just one of those professions that, you know, an old university friend of mine had recommended say, hey, why don't you, why don't you give this sales uh, game a go? It's, I think you've got the right personality for it or something along those lines. And um, next thing I know, I'm, you know, I'm starting life as a, uh, well, what we, what we will frequently know as an SDR now, um, essentially working for a, you know, startup tech company and, and that's kind of where it all began. So, Nice. Regret it at all? You happy? <laughs> I, I, honestly, I can't regret it. I, I do think my parents, when they realised that I'd like, you know, they, they, you know, helped pay for my, uh, you know, my, my way through university, to then hear at the end of it, oh, I'm going to become a salesperson. And their perception of salespeople is probably what a lot of people's perception is, and it wasn't a positive one. And I think there was a kind of a feeling of, of between them of thinking, what on earth have we uh, have we paid for you to go to university for? And you know, why do you you did so well at school and all these kind of things? And you what you're gonna you're gonna start to like you know cold call people and you know sell them double glazing or something was probably what they they thought of. So, um, but no, I, I don't regret it. I think they've came to realize that it's been. Um, you know, it's been a, a fantastic career choice for me. It's, uh, I think sales has made me really just more well-rounded as a person and how I communicate in my, uh, my personal life as well, Rich. And, um, and there's so many transferable skills, uh, when you truly study, you know, what good salesmanship looks like or sales, the sales skill, should we say what, what that looks like is it's, it's so transferable helps you become a, a much better communicator and, a much better manager of people, quite frankly, in your personal life. So it's, uh, I, I, I've got no regrets about it whatsoever. Quite the opposite. How, how often do you, do you roll out the sales skills to uh, get your kids to do things? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so funny because um, I, I always like when I think about how do I apply, um, how do I apply my sales skills in my personal life? And it, I think it's in even things like diffusing, you know, tense situations or. Um, trying to, you know, influence, influence things that I would like to happen and doing it in the right way, but also, you know, spending the time to really listen and understand and take people's perspectives. And um, so I, I probably do it now without me realizing. And, uh, and, and my, my wife probably says I get my, my own way probably too much of the time. So um, maybe that's says something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, but you didn't, you didn't, uh join a Lego through recruitment and you briefly mentioned refract in the, in the type. So you co-founded refract. What, what right. is refract and, and why, why a tech startup? Why go down that route? Yeah. I think if I um, start on the second question there, why tech startup, I, I, that's kind of where I began my career in sales and what I liked about it. I, I kind of, from that moment, I didn't really ever see myself really enjoying being part of a big, massive company where, you know, you have quite a small voice and um, lots of red tape and, and maybe just, you know, difficult to really make a mark on the, on the business. Um, and so because I started life in a, you know, tech company where I was the, you know, employee number, I don't know, six or seven at, at the time, I kind of saw what it was quite, what it was like. It was, you know, it was agile. It was flexible. It was, um, you know, it was fun. It didn't, there wasn't tons of rules and um you know some people do quite like that in their day job they quite like that sort of um structure i guess and for me that that just wasn't really me and so um that and i just kind of i think in that time i've seen you know te uh, tech startups have been some of the the best innovators of sales um 
in in recent years and uh and uh yeah and refract was you know was definitely a tech startup we were you know when i when i uh, when we we came up with this idea and it was nothing more than just a, a few ideas on a, on a on a google doc at the time and um refract was was basically a a product born from some of our own experiences in sales from sales management but also just as a, a salesperson and i i i um, always remember as a salesperson rich it was had those frustrations that you know when i go back to my my first um my first job in sales i i always got this frustration of experienced sales people kind of picking their laptop up and walking into a, a meeting room to do their demos and they didn't want me to come in and listen in and i all i wanted to do was listen to how they sold i wanted to kind of learn from what the experienced people were doing i wanted to listen to what you know prospects and customers were saying why because i wanted to be in their position i want to be in their seat i wanted to be doing my own deals and, and such like um and uh and and also i i just wanted the ability to when i was doing my own selling i i, I wanted pointers and feedback i want people to tell me what i was doing well what where i was wide of the mark why i wasn't being as successful as i as i aspired to be and there was no really way strong way of doing that with busy managers who you know you could barely get you know th then to sit in on a meeting was a big co commitment of time so um so that was the idea behind refract which was essentially you know the the, the, the category is has, has been named as conversation intelligence it, we didn't certainly give it that name but we it was weird it was go back seven or eight years if you use that phrase nobody would have a clue what you mean um now it's became pretty table stakes that you have this sort of technology in your tech stack and, and ultimately it's all about the capturing of sales conversations and the ability to give you know valuable insights to the to the business as to what's going on in those conversations because those conversations are critical right they're they're key to business success the outcomes of those conversations when seller meets buyer in a on a zoom call and or what have you so um uh and and yeah it's uh it was a great journey and um as i say it's it's became a it's just became one of those types of technology that almost you know most forward thinking sales organizations have at their disposal now at what at what point did you go from google doc to holy shit we've actually built something here <laughs> yeah that's a good question because like the first version of the platform i remember like you know when i think back to it i'm thinking god why did anybody spend you know even the 90 pounds a month or something we were charging back then um and but i think it was the realize it uh, you know during that early part of the journey you you had it hammered in your head of like don't try and sell to everybody right pick your your niche and just focus on that and and despite us being told that we we still did the opposite we still try to sell to everybody um and uh and i think it was it was getting to those like customers where you could actually start to paint a picture of hey it's these types of companies that are getting the most value from the product out of the whatever the 30 20 20 to 30 customers we've got on board these 10 are getting the most value and these 20 probably aren't and those 10 all sort of have similar characteristics and uh and i think it was at that point we kind of you you sort of realize that you're onto something and um and that's when it just became a bit easier to sell and you know it, it definitely took a long time to get to that stage i think it was a lot of the early states conversations were like oh record sales calls why would i want to do that and um and slowly those objections just became less and less i think as people just became more realized you know realizing the value that this could bring to their how, how they operate as a business so yeah it wasn't it, it it definitely i've got no shame in saying it it probably took you know three years before we really started to see the um you know the kind of the wheels really moving so i guess that's a a lesson to anybody listen to this if like it might it might feel like hard work but if you feel like your your product didn't generate uh, you know you, you still just just keeping at it you know what and did you go was it a bedroom startup like organic growth or did you start off with investment or find an investor like how did you accelerate at that beginning bit we had a few um friends and family investors put it that way like angel investors <laughs> Tri it triple was, f funding yeah <laughs> nothing extravagant by any means it was uh you know enough to just you know help us get going and and then we ended up you know getting um uh yeah, vc investment but it was you know by all intents and purposes pretty small fry you know when you compare it to um others in our space uh but we um yeah i think that's just kind of testament to you know there's not um 
the big the big books aren't exactly getting invested in in small Newcastle tech startups, but that's just the that. But we, but we kind of I always say that we punched well above our weight. You know, we had some very noisy, well funded, um, much bigger uh, competitors, and and I feel like one thing that we did really well is uh, we we punched above our weight, and I, and I honestly think a lot of that wasn't necessarily down with the product. It was we we just became try to become really good at selling and and we knew that that was the way that we could uh we could really hold our we, own so without by blowing smoke up your ass we bought on on people as opposed to like product i'm not saying right. that the product is inferior yeah. or anything like that but we bought on i think over over what 12 months some of that so yeah entirely an elongated uh, sales process entirely my fault but the like over that period of time, like you and I had a kind of on off relationship where we would discuss right. different bits and pieces. And I think that was one of the primary drivers. Um, I think at the end we bought out of guilt because I've dragged you on for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never uh, I'd never I'd never um, brag about I've done a deal. I think they they, uh, they they felt guilty. But I think it just goes to show as well. It's, um, you know, it's how you inf it's how you influence people and that's not just in conversations it, it's uh what i the decision decision i made you know three years ago rich was um i wanted to just become more visible on linkedin i wanted to position myself as you know talking about problems and it's funny that you know the amount of um leads and business that that come our way because of that because we're just front and center because you connect with somebody um and uh and, and that's why i'm a big proponent that people should put themselves out there you know can it can it can lead to good things so i, I see it a, a lot more now and i even like use it as a sales tactic so do our team is you were the first tech sales person in the, mm. like when i was going through a buying process that basically said to me like this is probably not the right use case for what you're thinking about now come back to me when this is your use yeah. case and I, yeah. I, it was that it triggered for me i was like he's disqualified me and it's kind of now I, I kind of want it more now mm. <laughs> so so we went away figured out the use case had the right team for it when we did eventually um, come into it but it was yeah. the first time that had ever been used on me <laughs> but i think i you know my perception of that is um you know sometimes you have to be the front of prospects you have to say mm. hey like this isn't right for you right now or it's not like the way that you're thinking of using it you're not going to get the most value from it and i just think that's if 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 more people sold that way, they would actually get more trust with their buyers because their, their buyers become like, they realize, hey, I'm not just being forced to buy something. They're, they're actually, um, you know, kind of being challenged in their way of thinking. And it's about, you know, especially in the world of SaaS. So I guess I say it's that, that's, 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 that's a lie. It's any, any line of business that's trying to forge long-term relationships. You're not, you're not trying to work with someone for two months or six months or, even 12 months you want to you want to work with them for a long time right and so that's why it's uh i think it's important to you know have that um yeah just honest relationship with uh when, when you're selling you also wrote a book tell me about it yeah uh it was a bit of a random um random idea in, in during covid we um me and a couple of my colleagues we, we we started doing these uh weekly kind of prospecting boot camps it was just it wasn't us selling refract. It was literally us showing up every week and doing a, here's some, you know, tips and tricks that's working for us that you might want to use in these uh, turbulent times when people were, um, you know, a lot of companies were going through a bit of a bad spot. And it was uh, Kev, my, my co-founder who, who just made the suggestion saying, guys, why don't, have you ever thought about writing a book? And at the time we all just said like, that's ludicrous. Like it's only, you know, you've got to be a skilled author to write, write a book. And, and he, he just encouraged us to do it. And the more that we, um, uh, realize it's actually never been easier for anybody to publish a book with, with, with Amazon. And so, um, yeah, the, the three of us just started on, um, weekends cause there wasn't a lot else to, to do. You couldn't go anywhere. So we, um, we would literally go on Saturdays and Sundays. We would jump on zoom for three or four hours and we, um, you know, we'd write stuff together. We proofread with other stuff and, um, the, 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 the book is all, it's called problem prospecting. It's, uh, it's basically, we wrote it with, our, I, the idea that we had in mind is, hey, can we make this like a playbook for any salesperson that just wants to, you know, get better at prospecting or learn some prospecting, you know, um, tactics and each chapter kind of dedicating itself to a different channel. So one on cold calling, one on email, one on video, one on objections. Um, and we're really pleased because that's how it's been perceived by the people who've bought it. They say, you know, hey, I bought other prospecting books before, but they're all a bit kind of pie in the sky you know 
he is um he is how i made you know my first million pounds in sales and all this kind of stuff and and that's just not relatable to a lot of people and we get you know people sending us messages saying hey i i have th- i have this book by my side and when i do my when i do my day job every day and i i, I always refer back to it to get some ideas and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve with the book and to be honest rich we 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 said when we when we released it said hey if we sell 100 copies of this thing we'll be like over the moon and you know i think we've sold like 4000 copies or something like that and it's um we've never it's never been for the money <clears throat> you can't really make much money when mr bezos takes his slice of the pie you can't you're not you're not left with much else and so, uh, but, but it's do just you been... use it in your sales process, though? As in, like, do do you use it to give you credibility in your sales? Not that you don't have any, but like, do you use it as part of your sales and marketing now? Yes, I'd say that we haven't been proactive. It's just been kind of a people have came to us saying, "Hey, like, I bought this book for my team, and you know, like, you guys seem really credible, and it's it's kind of helped us that way." You know, we're not we're not necessarily sending out like free copies to people as a way to kind of get them on the hook or anything like that. Um, maybe, maybe we should do that, do more of that, but it's definitely, it's definitely helped build awareness and, and credibility and, and um, genuinely it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Like the it's, it's, it's been a, a real pleasure just for more than anything else, just to get the, the comments and messages from people saying how it's helped them. So it's genuinely been one of the best things I've ever done. Well, I think four thousand odd copies makes you a legit author as well, doesn't it? <laughs> Even for self-published, not a, I think not a pretendy author. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're in you're in tech and SaaS, um, and it feels a little bit like the Wild West out there at the moment with the recent uh, tech layoffs. Has a Lego been affected at all? Um, not so much, I'd say. Um, I think Lego is maybe a slightly unique company in our space, and that Lego hasn't again maybe on similar to refract the lego hasn't gone out and raised hundreds of millions of dollars worth of funding like some of our competitors have and and as a result they've kind of um you know their org- the organization isn't <clears throat> isn't so bloated i think a lot of tech companies they've been under pressure to you know they've had all this money they've been told to grow at all costs and a lot of companies obviously had a boom during covid for one reason or the, one reason or another and now they're suddenly the the tables are being turned and they realize that they're, they're, their investors are saying the opposite here you need to cut cost yeah. cut cost at all cost and um so lego are kind of i guess uh grown a bit more organically uh, so so to speak and i think that's um made made the business uh yeah a little bit less like needing to do that quite frankly um i'd say that on the um on a, another way of looking at it has a lego been affected yeah i mean we're we're we're, we're seeing the effect of it in sales cycles you know like uh, that's that's definitely one way that we're being affecting affected we we sell um tech companies as a big vertical that we sell to um and uh yeah we're, we're seeing deal slippages and you know deals that will look like they were all good and suddenly they're not because the company's um you know just had to lay off 100 folks or or, or whatever and so we're definitely seeing the impact in um more in our kind of sales you know like many other companies will um versus like within the business itself if that makes sense yeah i think we're, we're seeing very similar like i think we're not losing many deals that like as in we're not the deals aren't going dead but a lot have pushed and Slow then down. closing so we're going from like from 60 to 100 and kind of like pushing the days out more and yeah. more and, more. and we've had a couple of cases where the champion is like gone overnight yeah, and then yeah, yeah. kind of like we're reassessing this now because we need to understand who's leading on that side so it's i, I think we're not affected in terms of like we're self-funded we don't have investors yeah. or anyone driving that kind of stuff but all of our tech partners have been affected at right. some level which yeah is interesting to see i think i think i think you know the deal slowdown is this that's the thing that we've seen most similar to yourself rich and i think there's um that's been driven by a couple of things it's it's a the comp like companies being a bit like trying to see how it pans out uh, but i think a lot of it is that you know the cfo is getting involved in it. It, it, it we're seeing this in our deals pretty much every single deal the cfos and so there's there's just more people more layers of decision making that these things have to go through more inspection on deals and it's um it's definitely <clears throat> you know whilst it's a challenge it's i think it's an opportunity for for sellers to to become to learn how to adapt and to have to to approach these situations to what they haven't you know had experienced before conversations with cfos a lot of a lot of salespeople would never have had to have done that before and they're now having to 
learn how to approach that and learn how to arm their champions with business cases and such like. So it's, you know, I think for any salesperson watching this, I see it as, yes, it's tough, but it's, it's a, it's an opportunity as well to, to, to add a new strength to your bow that you may not have had before. Who would you rather have a call with a CFO or a procurement team? Oh, CFO all day, every day. (laughs) (laughs) As much as I love procurement teams, if any are listening. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so sales is just a numbers game right so you hit the phone enough and you're gonna hit target is that the case um it is partly the case um you know i'm a still big i'm still a big believer i, I actually did a post on the, on the linkedin post on this this morning which kind of spoke to this that um those who consistently show up and do the activity yep. i i think you can you can get by by just doing that you know, but as long as you're consistent, your, your activity is good and your consistent activity, you'll probably get in the long run. OK, results, because um, a lot of people aren't consistent. You know, a lot of people might do some, you know, might uh, hammer it for a day, but then they'll, you know, ease off, ease off the, the pedal the next day. Um, that being said, uh, as I, the reason I, I said it's part of it is that it's um it's also down to execution and quality, you know, and, and I, and I know this, I, I can see this in my own team. I, I, you know, the person who has the most discovery calls doesn't always close the most deals. Right. And, uh, uh, and, and so it's, it's never really been different in my, in my career in sales. You know, I'm not having had the longest career in sales compared to some, but, you know, let's just say I've, I've been in sales for not on 15 years now. And, um, you know, I, quantity plus plus quality plus consistency gets gets the results at the end of the day and if one of those things is is lacking you probably your, your results are going to be impacted but um yeah i i think it's a uh, i i do think the more and more as my career develops i do see that those who work smarter those who focus more on execution usually get the best results versus the people who just do you know work the hardest so to speak um do you guys do you guys use a like a model or a framework so like band gbct medpick any of those not not so much i mean we um as a as a sales team we're kind of like sandler trained so sandler is Mm -hmm. uh, a general methodology that we we try and operate and I, i quite like sandler because i think um it's the whole concept of it is is designed to be very low friction you know selling it's about you know it's 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 not using any um uh you know fancy questions to like you know try and mind warp your prospect um uh and it's funny because methodologies my perception on them is that most method most methodologies often just you know of just different versions of the of the next one in 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 some respects um and I, i think a lot of it in my career, I've just kind of taken little bits of, you know, different ones and, 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 and kind of put my own spin in it. But I, I honestly think it kind of overcomplicate things a lot. I think good, good selling ultimately comes down to spending time with the right prospects. Um, you know, good active listening, listen to what's really being said in the call and, and responding effectively to that. Um, and just being in control as well, being in control of the sales process. Um, I'm sure that, probably follows a methodology but uh those things are the things that i think are you know really important there's probably somebody screaming out going but that's this yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the um so and like one of the things we see in like the hubspot partner ecosystem quite a lot is and like one of the most challenging hires to make is a sales hire because and like we get it wrong there's yeah. not they're not normally large sales teams it can be quite a challenge how do you source sales talent and what does a what do you actually look for in a good salesperson? Yeah, yeah I've my one of my biggest learnings in sales sales leadership is that hiring is one of the hardest things in the world to get right. It's so so difficult, and and uh, and it's I've learned so many lessons. Like every time I hire someone, um, I always learn new lessons about okay, I need to do this differently next time. I need to you know make sure I don't make that mistake next time. Um, to answer your first question, Rich, the um, how do we source talent? I mean, we work with we work with um, agencies, but actually, some of the best 
candidates that like I sourced come through LinkedIn, my own network. And, I, and again, I think I kind of realized that, you know, being active on LinkedIn, writing a book, all this kind of good stuff that one of the offshoot benefits of that will be to, you know, attract talent. Um, and, and I definitely see that. Um, and uh, so that, that for me is the, my, my biggest source is, is just people who, you know, I, I'm connected with or people who I, I'm, I'm, I'm connected with, but I don't realize I'm connected with and, but they follow me and they, you know, they, 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 they come in my inbox and such like, um, so what do we, what do we look, what do I look for in a good salesperson? I think it depends on what type of role I'm hiring for. If I'm hiring for like an SDR, maybe different to what I'm hiring, like a, an, an AE, um, but some of the similarities across both those, both those roles, like the, con, the consistent things, um, intelligence, like I think intelligence is such a big thing, especially selling what we sell. Um, you need to be smart. You know, you need to have good, fluent conversations with people. You need to, you know, you need to understand how to uh, manage complex sales cycles. You've got to be a good communicator, and you know, intelligence is really is re is really key. Um, you know, we 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 look for coachability. We 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 measure it aggressively in in the recruitment process. Um, essentially how moldable is someone how well can they how and how quickly can they learn you know they don't have to be the finished article when they join the company i think you know if they come in with a level of experience it's my job to and to unlock their hidden potential and to make them a better salesperson um and uh and so we 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 look for that we test for it in the in the recruitment process um but other things like things that I look for now that I didn't necessarily look for two or three years ago is, you know, quite frankly, people who are money driven. And I know it's like it sounds quite cliched. And going back a few years ago, I was kind of one of these people that said, oh, you don't have to be like money motivated to to like be good at sales. But actually, what I've learned over the years is uh, because people say oh, people have got other drivers. And, I, and it's an interesting because when I am. Um, when I speak with people and ask that question, how money motivated are you? And they say, oh, it's not my biggest motivator. I said, what's your biggest motivator? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, I want to I want to do well for my family. I want to support them. I want to buy a new house. I want to, you know, buy an engagement ring or whatever, whatever that motivator is. I'm like, all those things that you said, you need plenty of money to do to, for those things. And they're kind of the, the light bulb goes off in the head of like, oh, that's a good point. They just don't necessarily think themselves as money motivated when actually they are money motivated because they have to be motivated to to afford to be able to afford those things but i do believe it's those people who have a hunger that they want to earn good money are the ones that are the ones that pull themselves out of bed every morning and think right i'm going to go for it today and uh, that's difficult you can't you can't develop that in somebody you can't teach it it has to come from within and that's definitely something that i, I look for now that i didn't necessarily look for a few years ago so my my in a sales process, so I'm I'm not somebody who's typically financially driven. Like they're not my main drivers. I do still like the toys and kind of yeah, like this right. kind of stuff. The peripheral stuff is great, but my driver is I am super competitive. Like right. I, you, yeah, and that's and the finance bit is one of the KPIs around achieving. I guess yeah, exactly. Winning. So that's right. It's taken me a while to be like it's not actually the money; it's the number behind that that I'm competing against. That's the bit that's that drives me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going going from selling to managing sellers can be like quite a, a transition. How do you identify when somebody's ready or not ready, and how do you support them in that transition? Um. So the question is, how do you identify when someone is ready to to become a, a manager? Right? Is that the question you're asking? In in a sales team, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. Um. Because I, I think sometimes it's people who demonstrate a, a genuine um, willingness to want to support other people. Um, I think people who are proactive in being supportive of others um, is a really good, really good signal. Because actually, not, not everybody is built to be a manager. Not a lot of most people don't want to be a manager. In fact, for a lot of a lot of people, I actually cut them off being a sales manager quite frankly i think they, they see that as the the logical next step of their career but actually when they think about it they don't want to be responsible for people they don't want to be a you know deal with people problems which is you know half of my job is dealing with people problems and um 
they they actually they just want to do really well for themselves and that's totally fine and every company needs that type of person and um, they can still be a team person team player but ultimately they're what they come to work for every day is 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 is, is really to be focused on themselves um so i think to have that person who is willing uh, willingly wants goes out the way to support other people um that's a really good signal um but i think i think for anybody to become a, a manager they, they i do believe they have to be if not they, they're not necessarily a top performer but they have to be an achiever right they, they they need to have credibility because i think for anybody to like you know feel like they're reporting into or, or learning or being pushed to achieve sales results for someone who hasn't kind of walked the walk i think that's a big big ask you know um so i think i think they have to be an achiever again they don't have to be a top performer um so they're, they're the two things that i would that, that, that i would i would look for and when they when someone wants to be a manager i you know you have to test them and say and listen you do realize that you know your success is 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 their success you can't be the one to, you know if you close a deal that you've helped with you have to take no you know, you you have to you have to take no level of responsibility over that. You have to you have to appreciate that you're the one that's you're not going to get the recognition for that. You know, the the person, the salesperson, is the one that's going to get the recognition for it. How do you feel about that? And for some people, they don't like it because some people love getting praised and love getting the um the gongs rang about when they've they've closed a the deal and all the rest of it. And it's about you know the people who are quite uh, that they they thrive off that. They thrive off helping other people succeed, and that's when. You know they've got the, they're in the right mode to be a good manager. What's the what's the biggest change you've seen in sales in twenty twenty three? The biggest change I've seen in sales I, that I think I'm gonna, that we're seeing is is this whole concept of buyer enabled selling. Um, prospects who want to do more of the buying <laughs> on their own terms. They don't. Sadly for uh, the likes of uh, myself, is that they they want to spend less time speaking with salespeople. Um, they want to do more of their their research. They want to do they want to do more of their their buying, not on a Zoom call live with a with with a with a, with a seller. And so I think the biggest change is going to be how do salespeople adapt to that? How can they provide great experiences to their buyers when they're not just on a call with them? Um, how can they how can they deliver that exceptional buying experience and you know truly add value to the sales process, the buying process? when they're not on a call with the prospect. So I think that's going to be huge. Uh, and the definitely the trends in the market show sure, that's going to become more and more that way too. Was it was it you who did a prediction for sales this year that saying like customer hubs or like purchasing hubs or like is likely yeah. to come to the fore? Yeah. yeah. I, see, I do read your posts. <laughs> Someone's reading them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that that's definitely like we call them digital sales rooms, but I do yeah. think that they are going to be they're called different things, you know, in different pockets, but I do believe that that's kind of that's what people are looking for and I you know, I'm, I'm in the process of buying a new car and the car dealership is kind of sending me almost my mini little sales hub and it's brilliant. I've got a personalized video there of the car. I've got little recommendations, little next steps in the buying process and I can consume all those things without having to be on a phone to a car salesman. So that's no slant against car salesmen, by the way. It's just like I get to, I get to consume that in my busy schedule, you know, because I haven't got that much time in the day to call the dealership. And I, I think that's just a window into what complex sales is gonna is gonna move to as well. So I was um I was always impressed when car dealerships move for like servicing move to showing you the problem via video so like they would say like this is the problem in your car show you a video prove it's yeah. broken before they ask you if you want it fixed <laughs> so like yeah the digitalization of uh car sales i mean um, this is the thing that they've been they've been, they've been slaughtered for years but they're at the forefront of sales these car salesmen good on them <laughs> um in in your opinion what does a quality sales engagement look like in 2023 um i think um that's a, that's a, it's a really good question i think i think first of all a quality sales engagement starts from having really good conversations you know with with prospects i i, 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 I staunchly believe that um and i think those conversations do not just need to be a salesperson asking a prospect lots of questions i think you know people are very precious with their time and people are very busy and i think it's about sales delivering valuable insights and you know sharing 
lessons learned to prospects. Um, I think, you know, making the prospect feel like they've got something from the call at the end of it, even if they're not going to buy, they feel like it was a worthy use of 30 minutes of their time or whatever that, that, that was. Um, and I think, um, and I think, you know, the, this, this concept of like digital sales rooms is, is also part of that is how can you continue sharing personalized material and content and relevant, relevant stuff to the prospect when that calls finished, you know, how can you, how can you be um, front of mind and giving the prospect, you know, stuff that they will value when you're, when you're not speaking with them. Um, but I also think, you know, quality sales engagement is, comes down to what we were speaking with the, at, at the, at the start, Rich is, you know, sellers, it's no pressure selling, you know, sellers saying to some buyers, that this might not even be ready, right for you or might not be ready for you. And I'm totally cool with that. And, uh, and I think that's just how what sales should be like. It's how you're going to become more memorable as a salesperson. If you if you could from scratch build the perfect sales organization, what would it look like? Um. Yeah, I think um, I think companies maybe try to overcomplex these things sometimes and have like all these different roles different in the different parts of the sales team. Um. I, I actually think, you know, like the, if I could have a, the perfect sales organization, it would be the salesperson who's managing the sales cycle from, from top to top to finish, because there's nothing more satisfying as a salesperson than starting an opportunity from cold, taking it all the way to the end. And I think, um, you know, I, I say this as a, as a, as a business, as a team, we have SDRs and then account execs and sales engineers. And, you know, we have different people involved in the, the process, but I think from a, a prospect's point of view, I, ironically, they, they, ideally they, they want to build a relationship with the uh, uh, engagement with, with one seller and having loads of people that they have to go and speak to at different parts of the process is probably not, let's be honest, not, not the best experience. So I think like, you know, there's a there's definitely a place I think for to go back to. Hey, what what if you could get you know those full cycle sales reps who ran with it from start to finish? Would they um would they would would it actually create better quality relationships when the customer actually signs up because they feel like they've they've been on the journey with the seller? Um, I don't know. I need to give that more thought, but in, in my head, I feel like there's a you know that would be a nice if, if there was a success i'm sure they are there are out there as well as successful organizations that are made up of pure 360 sellers well so we we have tried the um like uh sort of sdr to a right. equivalent approach with that yeah, yeah. hand up and we found the the handoff wasn't like it wasn't smooth for client and it was becoming yeah. a bit jittery and not right. really working for us so all of our sales team now are 360 like beginning to end mm, yeah. and they will bring in sales engineers or solutions engineers uh, like when they're needed right but what we find is like and that is great from a sales perspective but what we also find is that we also have to manage the relationship out of sales a lot more than you would expect as well because that relationship is built really well yeah we now have to make sure that as it's being passed across the delivery so it doesn't feel like sales are jumping out of that so now we have to make sure that there's continual conversations check backs and it doesn't like feel that. like a, i've sold you this now see you later yeah and that and that that's a great that's a great example of where you know there's accountability on the salesperson to follow through on hey yep. i've sold you the dream but i'm going to make sure that you see the value you know and not just disappear once the once the contract is signed and i think there's i just can see how that would have better um you know it's a, it's a better experience for the customer so this this is my favorite question by far from all of these. What's your biggest career fuck up so far? The one you've learned the most from? <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I I would say, um, it was not not investing in getting better at sales earlier in my sales career. Like I've I've learned more about sales in the last um you know, five years than I, than I learned in the previous, um, you know, 10 years. And I remember the early part of my career, I've got to be honest, I was winging it. Like, you know, I, I, I wasn't spending time like immersing myself in, you know, learning how to become better at sales. And part of that in my defense was like, there's, 
a lot of that content just wasn't as freely accessible as it is now. You know, like you, you can go on LinkedIn and there's people share stuff on there that they would you would have had to have you know spent thousands of pounds to attend the training course. And um that's just that's the way that the expectations of the world now. People expect more information on demand. But I think if I go back, you know, I, I truly I, I I I was slowed down my success as a salesperson, made far less money than I could have, I think, by just winging it, you know, not really learning how to sell properly, just, you know, showing up on demos, chucking a PowerPoint presentation at a, at a prospect and sort of asking, you know, want to book the next step. And it was literally, a, a, I, 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 my, my, my sales was all built on hope with a little bit of charisma, you know, uh, polished in. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think my, my, my biggest mistake undoubtedly undoubtedly was just not spending enough time earlier on my career saying right i need to learn how to actually do this as a, as a proper skill um and, and uh it wasn't a specific point in time that i think i i think but i just in general that's that's what something i always reflect on and to be fair you didn't have sales enablement tools like at lego when you started though, did well you? exactly yeah it was it, it was <laughs> it, it, it was a it was a phone and a it was a phone my microsoft outlook email account and a genuinely i remember I had this, um, it, it was a phone book. It was a phone book of businesses in the UK. It was that thick and it was, was it a Tom, Thompson local. I think that was pretty, something, something similar to that. And I, that's, that's genuinely where I, what I started doing was just literally calling random switchboard numbers of various companies in the UK and just, you know, try my best basically. So, uh, yeah, but definitely, uh, definitely wish I could have uh, learned more earlier on in my career. Last question. Who should I interview next on the six sessions? Yeah, lots of um, lots of people, uh, lots of people spring to mind. Um, I, uh, um, I always think he's he's really good. <laughs> he's good value. He's a he's a Marmite character. You'll see it himself. I think Benjamin Dennehy is always always a really uh, got a lot of interesting things to to say. For those of you who don't know, he's the uh, the UK's most hated sales trainer. That's his actual self proclaimed title, and he's a uh, he has some very interesting perspectives on sales. You you won't agree with them all, but I think he actually at the heart of it talks a lot of a lot of sense. So um, I'll I'll uh, I'll nominate Benjamin as a as as a as a worthy guest of this podcast. Nice. I've I've got a special place in my heart for my mark characters. So oh, well, there you go. Work. <laughs> Rich, thanks for being up for doing the six sessions for me. First of the year, I think like you didn't balls it up, so that's good. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody wants to follow up with you, how do you want people to connect? Yeah, best places on LinkedIn. Just just find me on there, Richard Smith of Lego. And uh, yeah, be delighted to connect with anybody that wants to. So, Perfect. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And thanks again, Rich. Cheers, Rich. Appreciate it.